straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. The family of George Floyd speaking out as jury selection is underway in the murder trial of Derek Chauvin. I think, you know, probably the best way to describe it is more like a, a roller coaster ride. And the ruling reinstating third degree murder against Derek Chauvin, we break down what the charge means for his defense and prosecution. Plus, our experts explain what to look for in picking a jury and the millions law enforcement is spending on security for the trial. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Angela Levy is in Minneapolis where jury selection is underway in the trial of Derek Chauvin charged in the murder of George Floyd. But first, let's get right to the presidential ruling reinstating the third degree murder charge against Chauvin. Derek Chauvin was charged with second degree murder, second degree manslaughter, and third degree murder. Trial judge Peter Cahill dropped the third degree murder charge saying there was a lack of probable cause. In February, the Minnesota Court of Appeals upheld the third degree murder charge in a separate case involving former Minneapolis police officer Mohamed Noor convicted of shooting and killing Australian American Justine Dumond who called 911 to report a sexual assault. Then, the Minnesota Court of Appeals ruled Cahill erred in dismissing third-degree murder against Chauvin, saying the Knorr decision was precedential. Chauvin's defense appealed to the state Supreme Court. The high court said Wednesday evening they would not review the defense's petition. Arguments then went back to trial judge Cahill. So, judgment has been entered on the appeal in this case, so I think we can address the merits. Defense attorney Eric Nelson says Chauvin's case is factually different from Knorr. But in the Noor case, Mr. Noor shot his gun across a part of his partner's chest towards a silhouette that could have been anyone or anything. And so that was clearly fit in the universe of depraved mind, danger to others, plural. Right. Uh, and I think the distinction we made in the original probable cause order last fall was this is a different case. It is more focused on a single person. Attorney Neil Katyal joined Attorney General Keith Ellison's office to prosecute the case pro bono. You know, it isn't necessary that more, quote, more than one person was or might have been put in jeopardy. That's this case. Uh, and so we think uh, you have the absolute discretion to have this charge, and we think you should. It, it reflects the gravity of the offenses. There is no instrumentality here other than arguably Mr. Chauvin's knee, which is not inherently dangerous, right? Judge Cahill ruled Chauvin will now again be facing third-degree murder. He then took aim at the Court of Appeals ruling. I think the Court of Appeals reaches too far by saying there's plain language in the rules. There is silence. There is not language prohibiting or saying that it is entered at judgment or that it takes effect immediately, but it is silence. And I think what the Court of Appeals has inferred from the silence is that opinions take immediate effect when filed. I accept that. Jury selection then resumed for day three. And Jeanette Levy is in front of the courthouse for us to bring us the latest. Yeah, Brian, so far six jurors have been seated. Five of them are men and one is a woman. The racial breakdown is three white men, one black man and one man who identified as Hispanic. The woman has been identified as a person of color and also described as multiracial. Now, prospective jurors have been asked a number of questions. Each one is questioned for about one hour each time. They're asked everything from their feelings about Black Lives Matter and whether or not they attended protests. They've also been asked, have they watched the video of George Floyd's death and the news coverage of his death and the civil unrest and protests that followed? Even when the video surfaced, like all you're gonna see is the, the picture of him kneeling in George Floyd's uh, neck or stuff like that. The media just, just puts things a little higher than, than what, what they are you can separate what you may have seen in the media from the evidence in this case. Yes. Do you think that to some degree your opinion about this case that you have coming in here today was influenced by the media? A little bit, yeah, but like I said, I still need to see the bigger picture evidence. Okay. Here yeah. witnesses and all that. There's more to that than just what media shows. 
And that really seems to be one of the things that the defense seems to be preparing for, that they're going to hammer on the media coverage of this case and the fact that everybody has seen maybe the video of George Floyd passing away, but maybe they don't have all of the information that's rel relevant, especially relevant to the defense case. And I want to mention today, for the first time, we actually heard a juror's social media account and something they posted on social media about George Floyd's death and visiting the area. We actually saw that brought up by the defense to call into question the impartiality of one of the potential jurors, and that potential juror ended up being stricken by the defense. Brian? Thanks, Anjanette. Joining us today is criminal defense attorney Imran Ansari and Terry Austin. Imran, these questions are running the gambit, and when I say questions, I mean the, the voir dire or jury selection questions. Well, they're running the gambit of Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, protests, property damage. How important is it to see how the people feel about these topics before trial? Sure, Brian, it's extremely important because when you have a case that has gained so much media attention, and has uh, brought out such strong feelings in the public, you need to make sure that you have a fair and impartial juror. Now, even in a regular case, that is the prime uh, concern of the attorneys, to get a fair and impartial juror who's going to give both sides a fair shake, and is not gonna be biased one way or the other and decide on the evidence alone. With a case like this, with so much media attention, that is all the more difficult and that's why these questions need to be presented to these prospective jurors to make sure they are fair and impartial. Now, Terry, murder in the third degree is back on. What does that mean for the case? You know, this is a huge victory for the prosecution. They've actually been arguing to bring it back in ever since the judge kicked it out for lack of probable cause. And it means now that the jury can consider this theory. And under this theory, it means that Chauvin acted with a depraved mind and without regard to human life. And it also carries a sentence of 25 years. So if you add that on, remember, the other two charges are still there. We still have the second degree murder and we still have the second degree manslaughter. And they carry sentences of 40 and 10 years, respectively. So in total, he could look at up to 75 years. Now, Anjanette, have you seen a change in the defense since the murder in the third degree charge was reinstated? Are they asking questions differently? You know, I, I wouldn't say they're asking questions differently because they still need to know the answers to the questions they've been asking all along. It did seem that Eric Nelson was a, a little nervous this morning when arguing when against that third degree murder charge being reinstated, but he has continued with the same line of questioning about, you know, if I met you out in a bar somewhere or at a party, what would you tell me about yourself? And, you know, questions about the impartiality and whether or not they took part in protests and really going off that questionnaire to see whether or not um, these jurors really feel that they can put any preconceived notions they have about the case aside and decide solely on what's presented in the courtroom. Makes sense. Still going full steam ahead. Thank you. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, our experts weigh in on how to pick a jury for such a high-profile trial. But first, the family of George Floyd speaking out. Hear what two cousins have to say as they sit in the courtroom during Derek Chauvin's trial, their advocacy, and Floyd's legacy, next. Welcome back. In the courtroom in Minneapolis, one seat is reserved for a family member of George Floyd because of COVID-19 restrictions. And Jeanette Levy sat down with two of Floyd's cousins who have been closely following the jury selection. You know, Brian, Sharita Tate and Tara Brown have each taken a turn this week sitting in that one seat reserved for the Floyd family during jury selection. They say the last nine months has really been a roller coaster of emotions going through this as a family and really with the rest of the world watching. And they say they are working to do something positive in George Floyd's name. To people around the world, George Floyd is the man who died on video in police custody and became a symbol of a movement to push for police reform. To Tara Brown and Sharita Tate, Floyd is their beloved cousin. I have so many memories um, because obviously we, we grew up together. He was always funny. Um, he was a jokester. Life changed forever for Floyd's family late last May when Sharita Tate saw a story on the news. I saw that and my first response was, this is so sad. 
I feel really sorry for this man's family. And then, of course, maybe five minutes or so later, I got the call saying it was Perry. So, you know, I said, okay, how did I miss that? The video went viral, sparking protests and civil unrest in cities across the country. I don't think there's a person on earth who would have predicted that it was going to happen this way, like that it would affect the entire world. For the last nine months, Brown and Tate have been focused on getting to the trial. There haven't been a whole lot of wins, per se, uh, in favor of these kinds of cases. But um, I have to believe that this will result in a different outcome. Just the sheer way in which this has moved forward and the movement that has started as a result. Derek Chauvin's defense maintains that Floyd died of a fentanyl overdose, not from Chauvin's actions. The fact that Floyd's drug use will be an issue is painful for the family. We expect that they will make him out to be, you know, um, somebody that he wasn't, um, or, you know, just to assault his character or whatever, just to give people a different kind of impression of him. Um, we're not saying he was perfect. And to remember their cousin, Tate and Brown have started the George Floyd Foundation. We have the three tenets that we're really working on. That's uh, uh, social justice, uh, workforce development, and youth services. It's kind of like anything that we can do that can, uh, you know, make sure people, uh, he has a legacy of doing things that are positive within the community. And, and, you know, we've always been people that wanted to give back. Now, both Tate and Brown said that they have not made any type of eye contact with Derek Chauvin when they've been in the courtroom. They said they're just really focused on the jury selection process. And Derek Chauvin, as you can tell, is always taking notes, and he is very focused on this as well. I asked them both whether or not they would ever say anything to Derek Chauvin, and, and if they had the chance, what would they say? And Tate said she would say nothing. Brown said she would hold back and not tell him what she was feeling or thinking. Brian? Thanks. Back to discuss the trial of Derek Chauvin and the death of George Floyd is defense attorney Imran Ansari and Terry Austin. Terry, for many, the death of George Floyd is more than a criminal case. It reignited a movement. How do you see this foundation or these cousins fitting into the change that comes after Floyd's death? You know, I think it's very important what they are doing. They are making sure that the world hears about this. And the world is watching. You know, they want to see whether or not he's going to be held criminally responsible for these actions. We've seen laws that have been passed making sure that chokeholds aren't being used. We've seen police procedures being changed. But the world is really waiting to see whether or not Chauvin is going to be personally liable for what he has done. And, you know, this case is of particular interest also because everyone watched what occurred on the video. So they're waiting to see what happens. Talking about what everyone watched, Imran, the defense is going to argue was the fentanyl, not Chauvin's knee, that killed George Floyd. With a video that graphic, do you think that's a strong defense? Well, the defense is going to have to back up that assertion with uh, hard scientific evidence. And with that video where you see the force of Floyd's neck, it's going to be a difficult story to sell. Um, that's why they're going to have to rely on the science, the levels of fentanyl in the blood system, and expert testimony that they're going to present to say that it wasn't the pressure that was applied to the neck uh, that caused his death, but it was a uh, sort of a, 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 a abundance of factors, including the fentanyl in his blood system, that would have contributed to his death. Makes sense. The only defense they probably have. And Jeanette, have the George Floyd's cousins watched the video? You know, I asked them whether they had seen it, and uh, Tara Brown said that she had avoided watching it. Uh, Sharita Tate said that she, I think, had seen some brief clips, and somebody had sent it to her, her inbox right after it happened, and she didn't want to watch it. And as you can imagine, I mean, it's, it is a difficult video to watch, and if you're a family member, it's even more difficult to watch that. You're basically watching a man die. So um, I, don't think, I don't think that they 
either one of them are looking forward to having to see these things in the courtroom, um, but neither one of them has been keen on watching the video. I can't imagine anyone in that family would. It's a truly devastating video to watch for anyone, yet alone a family member. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, the joint law enforcement effort to provide security during the trial. Plus, how many and who will sit on the jury? In the trial of Derek Chauvin, the questions, the answers, and the ones who made it to the jury, next. We're back. So what exactly should attorneys be looking for in these potential jury members? We asked jury consultant expert Alan Turkheimer just that. You bring in people that represent what the jury looks like. You match the demographics. You say, okay, Hedema County is 80% white. And then you want to get a range of age, occupations, and get them in there. Alan Turkheimer is the founder of the litigation consulting firm Trial Methods. He says jury selection is one of the most important phases of any trial but will be key for both the prosecution and defense of Derek Chauvin. From the defense perspective, in a case like this, you really want to have people who can get past the emotional aspect of the video, who are thinkers from a logic standpoint, who connect dots, who maybe are a little more methodical in the way they think, so that they don't just see that horrible video and make up their mind. Potential jurors have to fill out a 14-page questionnaire describing how much they know about the case and their opinions towards law enforcement and Black Lives Matter. I think they could probably just look at the questionnaire, look at some of the responses and think, okay, we have some that are really extreme on one end, the, the pro-BLM side and then the pro-police side. And some of them, I think, could just get tossed. They wouldn't even have to waste their time bringing some of the jurors in. Of course, people know about the case. Of course, they've seen the video at that point then they have to really dig in deep and try to determine whether or not somebody, yes, you can still pay attention to the news, but not have a vested interest. For the defense, Turkheimer suggests pretrial strategies like focus groups, mock trials, and venue attitude surveys. If I was for the, working for the defense, I would say, hey, here's a videotape, some videotape of the officer, Chauvin, let's uh, hear his explanation and let's get some focus group reaction to it, hear what these people have to say, what they expect, do they believe him? Do they like him? Turkheimer says both sides need to look out for people who have hidden agendas and are intentionally trying to get on the jury, also known as stealth jurors. You want to make sure you don't have anybody who seems too eager to get on, but it's really tricky because these stealth jurors tend to know what to say to get on. They tend to moderate or temper their answers. They know to say they should be fair and impartial. So you have to take a holistic approach. Jury selection is scheduled to take three weeks. Opening statements are set for March 29th. It's going to be a challenge. I think they can do it, given that they have all this time to pick a jury, but it's certainly going to be a real challenge. A challenge indeed. When we come back, what is the city of Minneapolis doing to prepare for the trial of Derek Chauvin? Which agencies are involved and how much it's all going to cost? Welcome back. The cost for security during the Derek Chauvin trial could be in the millions of dollars and in a plan that began months ago. The Minneapolis Police Department teamed up with the Sheriff's Office, State Patrol, as well as the National Guard to create Operation Safety Net. Barricades and fencing reportedly cost up to $1 million and a mutual aid agreement has cost the city another $1.5 million. The plan provides security in and around the courthouse as well as creates a safe place to protest. For the last eight months, uh, we have had a unified command uh, and the planning has been labeled Operation Safety Net. Uh, these are, I'm so very proud of our mutual aid partners who continue to uh, be with us along the way to not only ensure that Minneapolis uh, remains safe and uh, a place where all those can gather to practice their First Amendment rights, but we are also a metro and region-wide response in the event it should be needed. Minneapolis police announced the arrest of a suspect for a deadly shooting days ago at the George Floyd Memorial site. Local reporters say the intersection is essentially an autonomous zone where law enforcement is not welcomed. There's the respect and folks gathering and, and utilizing that space uh, to pay re its respects to, to Mr. Floyd. At the same time, I'm hearing overwhelmingly from community members who quite frankly are, are feeling hostage over there at the situation. We cannot allow um, for that violence uh, to continue and to happen. We have to open up that intersection. 
And I know that may be difficult for some people who've been holding space in there since last year, but we have to open up that intersection. We have all uh, community, city enterprise, been supportive of a plan uh, to make the location where George Floyd was killed to never have vehicular traffic go over it again. And I'm talking about the specific location, uh, and we do hope to move forward with uh, a bump out uh, to allow for a memorial to be placed there. Here one last time to discuss the security in the murder trial against Derek Chauvin is Imran Ansari and Terry Austin. Imran, how important is security for the lawyers, the defendant, the jurors, and the trial itself? Brian, it's really important because you want the attorneys uh, on the case to feel comfortable. You want the jurors to feel safe and comfortable. You don't want them distracted, meaning the jurors, as they hear the evidence in this case and make a decision. So security is immensely important because it's not only protecting those involved in the trial, but it's also protecting those members of the public who are gathering to peacefully protest. Makes sense. Terry, let's ask the obvious question. Is this too much for a city to dish out for a trial? Absolutely not. You know, one of the things I always say is you got to do what you got to do. And I listened to the mayor's press conference this morning, and I think the measures he's taking make complete sense. He wants to make it a safe environment. He wants the businesses to thrive. And he said he wants to make sure that there's a memorial for George Floyd. So I think he's spending the money. He's doing the right thing. He's making sure it's safe. And he doesn't want this autonomous zone because, you know, you, want, you don't want to keep anyone out. Makes sense. Be sure to check out the Law & Crime Network for gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the Derek Chauvin trial. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.